Hello, I'm Richard Gisbert, and you're at the Listening Post. This week, the summit of spin. Vladimir Putin uses the media to hijack the G8 agenda. Outsourcing journalism, reporting on California city council meetings from India. The one-liner the Chinese authorities didn't like. And the Japanese take on Tetris, a video game turned into a game show. <laughs> Welcome back to The Listening Post. In some ways, it was a typical G8. Inside the cordons, the meticulously choreographed photo opportunities, the carefully written communiques. Outside, demonstrators bent on shifting the media's focus and getting their concerns on the political agenda. But what set this G8 apart was what happened prior to the meeting. Russian President Vladimir Putin had everyone talking about missile defense and the prospects of a new Cold War. And he used the media to do that. That's our starting point this week and the focus of our news divide. The media spin doctors who tried to seize the initiative at the G8, starting with a dinner at the Kremlin and ending in a small town in Germany. Leaders of eight of the world's richest countries arrive in Germany for the G8 summit. For every leader attending the G8 summit, there are more than 100 reporters. Do you need to have 800 reporters there? Certainly not, you know. There is a sort of almost iron law that the number of journalists covering an event is probably in inverse relationship to the importance of the story. And uh, as a result, there are a very large number of journalists at these events. I've never really enjoyed covering them because it, much like covering the Academy Awards, it must be said, or something like that, in that you cannot get beyond what's being said to you from the podium very easily. The G8 feels a little bit that way. You think, why are we all spending our time listening to the exact same sound bites when we could be sitting back in our bureaus watching these same sound bites on CNN, scribbling them down and so on, or we could actually be out in the field writing on something that nobody else is. However, there was a wild card at this year's summit, and it was dealt before the G8 even started. The Russian president let it be known that if the U.S. and its allies went ahead with plans to establish a missile defense system in Central and Eastern Europe, Russia would re-aim its missiles at Europe. That message was delivered through journalists who the Kremlin summoned to Moscow, one from each G8 country. I got a call on my cell phone from somebody from the Kremlin, and all he said was, at 3.45, come to Red Square. There's a door in the Kremlin wall beside it. Please wait and stand beside that door. You will be ushered through the door and, uh, and taken to the president's country residence. It sounded very... John le Carre, very cloak and dagger, well, we'll find you in Red Square, you know, I thought. And it'll be about two hour drive and that sort of thing. And there it also got quite unusual. We were deposited in this antechamber, this, this reception room. I likened it to the mood almost to Tony Soprano's living room or something like that. It, it, it was redolent of the bad old days of Russian government uh, under Yeltsin. Over a two hour dinner, Vladimir Putin used the assembled journalists to deliver a message that effectively reset the G8 agenda. That the headline sentence, his warning that if the United States placed this missile shield facility in Central Europe, he would target his country's arsenal, including potentially nuclear weapons, at locations in Europe for the first time since the USSR. That was obviously something that he had planned well in advance. Putin felt he had to get in, and what he did say was something that his military chiefs had said some months before, but that if, if the Americans went ahead, he would have to retarget his own missiles on Europe. And that was obviously a you know, dramatic a ratcheting up of the, the rhetoric we'd ever heard from him. And it was very successful. I mean, I think um, many people then thought this was a sort of Cold War G8. Our paper put it on the website on Saturday before, and it was probably the biggest uh, hit we've had all year. The Guardian, which was not at the interview, made it a gigantic type headline on Monday morning. Uh, the, it was what we call Jesus type, you know, the big letters uh, that, uh, that said the new Cold War. Um, I, I would say most of the world's media dropped everything for this on the Monday. For the Kremlin's media strategists, it was mission accomplished. And by the Tuesday before the summit, the American president was in Prague forced to follow the Russian agenda. Russia is not our enemy. The enemy of a free society such as ours are, would be a radical or extremists or a rogue regime trying to blackmail the free world in order to 
promote its ideological objectives. Mr. Putin is very good at playing the chess game of international politics and using an interview like this to accomplish rhetorical tasks. He certainly managed to make his dispute over the missile defense system the main item on the agenda of the G8. And remember, that had not been an item on the, on the agenda of the G8. Uh, it was going to be uh, climate change. It was going to be aid for Africa. Those things did end up popping up, but they were certainly overshadowed by this business of the radar base in the Czech Republic and the surface-to-air launcher in Poland. Um, and again, he seemed to be thinking two moves ahead in this chess game. It successfully um, captured the attention of the Western media ahead of the summit and during the summit when the counter proposals were made by President Putin. They showed the uh, essence of the Russian position. Uh, we can see that in the, uh, during the summit and later on there is, no, there is much less rhetoric about Cold War uh, looming in the Western press. Uh, everyone appreciates that it's, uh, Russia's position is quite constructive. This was not the first attempt by Vladimir Putin and the Kremlin to get Western political leaders to deal with the missile defense issue. However, this time, in the context of a coming G8, and by harnessing the power of the media, the Russians succeeded. I think President Putin succeeded in uh, putting the message across. It is, however, unfortunate that Russia needs to uh, get use of this kind of harsh language to put its message across. It's unfortunate that the Western media and the Western governments do not listen to, to when Russia speaks, uh, when Russia talks normally. Uh, that's why it's just the Western media and the Western governments make Russia shout. What is ironic is that Vladimir Putin's message was delivered through the Western press with the help of a Washington-based public relations agency. The company, Ketchum PR, helped the Kremlin outmaneuver the White House on this issue. That's the way it is in the new world order of communications. Time now for Listening Post News Bites. A leading female Afghan journalist has been shot dead at her home near Kabul. Gunman fired seven bullets into Zakia Zaki, the boss of a local radio station, as she slept with her baby son. Zaki, who was 35, had run the U.S.-funded station Peace Radio since 2001. She was one of the few female journalists in the country to speak out during the Taliban's rule. And according to the Afghan Independent Journalists Association, she had received warnings recently from local commanders to tone down her reporting. The beleaguered president of Pakistan, Pervez Musharraf, has abandoned proposed curbs on media coverage of opposition protests there. The climb down on the clamp down follows a week of nationwide demonstrations as well as international criticism of the ban, which had taken political talk shows off the air and threatened editors with jail sentences and fines if they did not comply. The television channels resumed their regular programming after they assured the government that they would prepare a new code of conduct to avoid any abuse of media freedom. In China, three editors have lost their jobs after failing to notice the inclusion of a one-line message in the small ad section of their newspaper, the Chengdu Evening News. The ad paid tribute to the mothers of the hundreds of protesters killed in Tiananmen Square in June of 1989. It said, saluting the strong-willed mothers of June 4th victims. The publication of the ad contravened a law that bans any public mention of Tiananmen Square and the pro-democracy protests. A new website has been launched which uses satellite imagery to help monitor events in Sudan. Eyesondarfur.org has been set up by Amnesty International as part of an attempt to pressure Khartoum into allowing UN peacekeepers into the region. The site, which will monitor 12 villages vulnerable to attack by militias, will be regularly updated with new photographs. Amnesty claims the satellite images can show objects as small as 60 centimeters across, so destroyed huts, massing soldiers, fleeing refugees, They'll all be evident. We're still feeling the fallout over the closure of the Anti Chavez TV station, RCTV, by the Venezuelan government. A divisive issue domestically, the station was complicit in a 2002 attempted coup, 
The controversy has now opened a rift in relations with neighbors Brazil. The Senate there called on President Chavez to reconsider the shutdown of the station. Chavez responded by telling Brazilian legislators to mind their own business and stop taking their political orders from Washington. Also checking in on this story, our Global Village Voices. Basically, the Danish news hasn't really covered the case that much, but when they do, it's mostly distortion and sometimes lies. Uh, it's very much, much uh, the viewpoint that this is an attack against democracy and against freedom of speech in Venezuela, and that Venezuela is moving towards uh, a dictatorship, and that this is a symptom of that. And uh, there is basically no media saying the opposite. I personally do not agree with the uh, decision of the Chavez government not to renew the license of RCTV for various reasons. RCTV were heavily involved in the coup uh, in 2002, which saw approximately 60 people dead and hundreds injured, including the kidnapping of the president. Uh, RCTV uh, not only manipulated footage, they were actually publicly thanked by the coup plotters. They met with them on numerous occasions. Um, so I think RCTV's uh, managers, editors and journalists uh, really have a lot to think about. Um, in my view, they should be uh, in front of a court of law uh, made accountable for their actions. If you have progressive ideas and you recognize there is a problem with the concentration of the communication, entertainment, information industry in a few hands, then in practice these few billionaires owning the vast majority of the mass media have used it to exclude the vast majority of the people from access to these tools and also to brainwash them to control their minds in the interests of the few then you have to support what's happening in Venezuela. If you have issues with global media and would like to be one of our Global Village Voices, then email us at listeningpost at aljazeera.net. If you have the technology, webcam, video, or even camera phone, we'll provide you with the platform. Coming up in part two, outsourcing the news.